So I'm going to talk about work that Larry and I have been doing to think about uh, just how to usefully model uh, the multiple time scales of firing rate dynamics. So I'm going to just briefly mention behavior to sort of motivate the, what, what we're going to think of as, as useful. Uh, there are obviously lots of time scales we could be interested in, but just sort of playfully speaking, let's say that we know that sort of on a long time scale, uh, the, you need to be able to have a train of thought that, that uh, will be coherent long enough to, say, complete a crossword puzzle, but also respond much more quickly if, say, you're interrupted by, by this guy. So I'm going to jump right to talking about firing rates, the reason being that we actually have reason to believe that firing rates can change on uh, the time scales that, that we're interested in. Um, I should say that sort of use, usually we, we think about firing rates sort of changing on, on what I'm going to think of as, as a slow time scale, and I'll, I'll define more carefully what I mean by that in a second. Uh, but firing rates can actually change uh, on a much quicker time scale. So to, to illustrate that point, uh, I chose uh, an example from my, an old paper from uh, Bill Bialik's group where they were interested in the stimulus response of an H1 neuron uh, in, in the fly. And they asked the question, if we present a stimulus that's either constant or rapidly changing, to this one neuron, present that uh, many times, uh, what, what does this neuron do on average? So let's, let's consider uh, the case on the left first. There's the constant stimulus, no noise. Look at how this one neuron responds over many trials. And then if we collapse uh, across trials to get a PSTH, or essentially a population firing rate, where here the population is really just many trials of, of one neuron, you get a nice flat uh, firing rate as a function of time with, with some noise. Now, uh, on the flip side, if we consider uh, a very rapidly changing <coughs> stimulus, here again I should say that uh, we're not going to think of this as noise because on every trial the neuron is going to receive this exact same uh, fluctuating input. Then what they saw was something very different, which is that the, the spikes tend to uh, align across trials. And when you look at, uh, at that in terms of a firing rate, it means that the firing rate is fluctuating rapidly between some very high value and, and essentially zero. So in terms of uh, motivating the, the question of what would be a useful firing rate description, all, all I want to say here is that this means that we need a firing rate description that's dynamic sort of across a wide, wide range. It needs to, in addition to the slow dynamics that we often think about, it also needs to be able to represent sort of very fast dynamics where we, we would expect that to happen in response to fast dynamics in, in the stimulus. All right, so I should say that it's uh, fairly intuitive where this uh, fast dynamic uh, can come from because any flavor of integrating fire neuron even in the uncoupled case, can do exactly what, what I'm talking about. So consider a case of unconnected integrated and fire neurons uh, receiving Gaussian white noise input with some mean that at, at some time has a, a step, sudden change uh, from, from some low value to, to a higher value. Uh, we look at, at what this does to uh, the, the unconnected neurons, which I'm sort of using to motivate, or think of this as like multiple trials, where here now, now we do have noise. What you see is that right after the, the change uh, in, in the mean, the, the probability of spiking goes way up, and then because there's noise over time, that, that damps out. So when you look at this in terms of a firing rate, it means that following the sudden change in, in the input, there is a very rapid change in the firing rate. And then the, the, the firing rate damps out to some steady state uh, just exponentially. So I want to contrast these dynamics with what we usually think of as sort of the, the simple, uh, easy to work with firing rate model. So we are, they're not from 
Well, it, not not the refractory period. It's the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I, as sort of my uh, uh, contrast model, I want to uh, consider a model, just a simple firing rate model like this, where the the firing rate the firing rate dynamics obey some nonlinear function of the input. We often think of this, or we often choose uh, f to be a hyperbolic tangent. And if this model were to say see a, a slowly varying input, then you know, let's say, just see the, the mean of this, which is uh, slowly fluctuating with, with some fairly large noise on top of that, then this model would, say, produce the green curve, and the, the underlying spiking model would, would sort of also follow this slow to change. But as I alluded to a second ago, the dynamics of the, the underlying spiking model would be very different if the input was changing quickly. So if this uh, were the, the input to, to this model, you would see something like this, where now the firing rate exponentially approaches some new steady state. And obviously, this is different from, from what the spiking model would do in the presence of this input. Um, I should say that here, you know, the reason we usually think of this model as being slow is that it's a good model for sort of the exponential approach to steady state. But obviously, it's going to miss any, any of this ringing dynamics if there are any, obviously, it, this doesn't have to happen. But if this happens, this model is really going to miss the, the faster dynamics of, of the firing rate. All right. So my talk is going to be divided into three sections. First, I'm going to just ask the simple question of how can we uh, usefully model, or how can we come up with a simple description of the, the response of a population of unconnected spiking neurons in response to some external input and sort of reproduce those dynamics with some sort of uh, well-defined rate model. And then second, I'll say, how can we use that, that formalism to uh, model a large spiking network, say, with excitatory and inhibitory neurons recurrently connected by, let's say, uh, a simple two-unit firing rate model with excitatory and inhibitory weights. And then finally, uh, at the end, I'll talk about some very preliminary work where we're thinking about what these kind of uh, approaches would do when we start to consider large, large firing rate uh, networks. All right. So to get started, uh, let's consider a large population of identical spiking neurons. And I want to define the firing rate as just the, the population average uh, over all these neurons. And our goal is twofold. First, we want a compact representation where I'll just sort of loosely define as, as few variables, and it'll become more clear what I, what I mean later on. Uh, and, and second, sort of intuitively, we'd like uh, our, our firing rate description to be composed of ordinary differential equations as opposed to, to partial. And again, why, why that's uh, useful will, will become clear as we go forward. So if we start by assuming that these neurons all receive independent Gaussian input, uh, then we have a diffusion process and the dynamics are going to be described by a fokker planck equation. So sort of uh, in general agnostic to what flavor of spiking model we choose, the fokker planck dynamics are going to look like this, where P, the probability density uh, over all the voltages, will be governed by some diffusion and, and drift. And then if we're talking about an integrate and fire model in, in any variety, we have a reset condition, which is just that the, when the voltage hits threshold, you have to move it to reset. And I, I'm bringing this up, although it seems sort of uh, innocent and, and almost trivial, because actually this, this little... Uh, I equation is actually the source of a lot of the problems that, that people have run into. Uh, the reason being that just the fact that the dynamics are discontinuous means that, first of all, the fokker planck equation becomes uh, in essentially impossible to solve for any interesting uh, neural system, but also it becomes complicated even to approximate. So I'll put here just uh, a sample of previous work sort of motivated along the same lines as what I'm going to tell you about, uh, where people have found useful uh, descriptions 
or approximations uh, to to uh, Fokker-Planck dynamics uh, for either the leaky integrate fire neuron or exponential. Uh, but although in all these cases people have been able to find very very accurate uh, approximations, the the general theme is that the approximations tend to be complicated. And if our goal is really to to think about uh, sort of a, a useful rate model, I'm going to suggest that, that we want something that's, that's at least tractable, if not simple. So, so what can we do differently? Um, I just said that, that the, the source of the problems are often just the boundary conditions. Yeah? Can you explain again the motivation behind the equation? Like, uh, compared with the trivial rate equation? In, in what like, sense? Well, so, I mean, we have, here, if we back up a second, I mean, at the moment we're just talking about uh, just independent neurons receiving Gaussian input, so the, the correct answer is a Fokker-Planck approach. I mean, if your question is why, why not use a simple rate model, or like the, the rate model that I started with at the beginning? The, okay. So maybe the better question is for a different question. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the idea. So I mean, I'm going to use the the simple case where we know that a Fokker-Planck approach is the correct answer, and then we'll, we'll move on to recurrent network where that is often a good approximation, but it's no longer. It, it's now an approximation. <laughs> so. This would seem to. I mean, the problem you first did it because it's running, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get we'll we'll get to that. If if I don't make it clear why that's true, then ask me again. All right. So I said if we can make the the boundary conditions trivial, then uh, th then we'd be in business. And it turns out that the quadratic integrating fire model has precisely the the property that that we want. Uh, that is that the quadratic integrating fire model, which can be written sort of in an idealized form like this, where some rescaled voltage v twiddle uh, is uh, receiving some uh, also rescaled input i, and then formally this this neuron fires when it hits infinity, and then reset is a negative infinity. And for analytic purposes, that's fine; it, it reaches infinity in finite time. But for for any simulation purposes, of course, you actually have to pick a, a threshold. So it, again, we have this. Uh, threshold and reset condition. But with the simple change of variables the, described first by uh, Bart Ermitraut and Nancy Capel, uh, where you can remap voltage onto uh, a phase variable phi, then we get what they call the theta model here. I'm unapologetically using phi instead of theta. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the theta model is going to look, uh, look like this, where Q is essentially uh, 1 over the, the membrane time constant. Notice there's no tau on the left. And uh, I of T is just going to be, again, the input rescaled by, by the, the membrane time constant. So now this model lives on a ring. It has periodic boundary conditions. So first of all, we've solved uh, the initial problem that I posed at the outside of just eliminating the boundary conditions. And we will hope that that, that makes the, the Fokker-Planck formalism sort of easier to approximate. Uh, but it also gives us, for free, a, another nice property, which is that now we have an intuitive basis in which to represent the dynamics. We can just Fourier expand uh, in, and see essentially how this model behaves in terms of frequencies. So just formally, I'll define uh, Zn to be the, the nth coefficient in the Fourier expansion in phase of the probability density uh, in phases. All right, so what did we do? Let's, as I said before, uh, we'll consider a population of, of uh, theta neurons receiving Gaussian input with mean I of t and uh, variance 2d, which in general can also be time varying. And now we have uh, a Fokker-Planck equation describing the dynamics, where here we have the diffusion term and, and the drift term. And now we're going to decompose P, as I said, into its Fourier series, 
and differentiate with respect to time because we're interested in how these coefficients are, are changing over time. And now we can basically plug in the, the Fokker-Planck equation into uh, our equation for the dynamics of z and compute the integrals. And we get a nice simple uh, system of equations where the, the nth coefficient uh, has dynamics that are coupled to itself, its nearest neighbors, and its next nearest neighbors. But we have a, a simple first order uh, linear set of equations. Uh, and now finally, uh, to, to make this a rate model, we need to note that the, the firing rate, uh, since we're talking about a distribution, the firing rate is going to be uh, just given by a weighted sum of, of all the, the Fourier coefficients. Now, yeah. Sorry? DT? Yeah. No, that, that's the diffusion. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So we have, uh, we, we've now decomposed the firing rate into an infinite sum of, of the, the Fourier coefficients. Obviously, that's not useful unless we can approximate that uh, by truncating the series from negative n to n. And we know that you know, if we had some static case, obviously, we'd, we'd be able to reproduce that keeping enough terms. Really, the question is, can we truncate uh, at some reasonable, reasonable value without destroying the dynamics? That's a, a less trivial uh, approximation. All right, so does it work? The, let, let's consider first a simple case. Uh, uh, the example that I showed you before, where we have a uh, Gaussian input that at some time just has a discontinuity in, in the mean. Now, the, the population of, of theta neurons, each receiving different instantiations of, of this Gaussian input, will we'll have uh, some uh, ringing dynamics as they approach steady state. Oh, is it? Can everybody hear me better now? All right. All right, we good? Okay, so uh, we have the dynamics that I showed you before for, for the population of spiking neurons. And uh, when we look at the firing rate either of the spiking neurons or of this new uh, rate neuron that we just defined, we see that we can essentially match these dynamics keeping only the first six terms. Now, this is actually sort of an intermediate case that I decided to show you. There are easier cases, uh, and as I'll show you, there are also uh, much harder cases. So let's, let's think of the, the most pathological uh, input that, that I could give this. Let's say that now, again, we have a Gaussian input, but now the, the mean is, uh, is fluctuating at a resonant frequency of, of the network. Then the spiking neurons tend to synchronize, in this case, uh, quite a bit. And again, we can actually reproduce that the synchronous uh, dynamics with there's a very spiky uh, rate dynamic. Here we need to keep 20 terms. And the intuition for why this works, uh, sort of getting back to Peter's question, is that although the dynamics are becoming synchronous, they're, they're still conditionally independent, uh, or the spikes are still conditionally independent given this firing rate. So es essentially, uh, it, we can reproduce the, the firing rate because the diffusion approximation is still going to be reasonable. What's so, the, what is the difference between the different uh, neurons? Different noise realization? Yeah, just different realization of the noise. And, and you're comparing it to, to the theta model or to the... Yeah, so, the, the so th this is the theta neuron. Which is yeah equivalent to the quadratic integrating fire, yeah. but yeah, I, I'm not comparing to the leak integrating fire or, or any of those. Um, all right. So let's consider another uh, pathological case of uh, again an oscillating input that is not at a resonant frequency, but at some intermediate value where you actually get some combination of synchronous bursts and, and asynchronous bursts. Uh, this is essentially the most pathological case for, for this uh, setup that I could think of. 
And, and again, uh, we were able to, to match the, the firing rate uh, dynamics, keeping 20 terms. Now, 20 terms might seem like a lot, but first of all, we almost never need this many terms. And second of all, uh, well, OK, never mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right, I'll leave it at that. Um, so <laughs> so the, the model works. Um, oh, no, OK, never mind. I remember what I was going to say. So you missed the sharp peaks. Yeah, so, so we missed the sharp peaks. And, and obviously, part of that is uh, finite size issues that we're not capturing because our rate model is assuming the, the infinite. Uh, you know, the truncation. So it, it's both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so it's both. I mean, first of all, if we if we kept more terms, it would be able to get get sharper, of course. Um, but yeah, the, then also, I mean, I guess yeah, you know, you're right. In in this case, it's it's systematic, so it's the truncation. Right? All right. So why does it work, and when does it break? Uh, if we go back to just the, the equation for the the dynamics of the coefficients. We can rewrite this uh, just as a, a linear uh, a linear matrix uh, equation, uh, where now all of the the coefficients are going to be wrapped up in this matrix A, where because uh, each each of these guys is only coupled to its two nearest neighbors in either direction, we have a pentadiagonal matrix and everything off off that is zero. And saying that that this approximation works is equivalent to saying that. The, the eigenvalues or the, the leading eigenvalues of this large matrix are equivalent to the leading eigenvalues of some small matrix. We're here. I, I'm showing you the middle piece because we're, uh, we're we're going from z zero out in both directions. So this is for I'm sorry, this yeah. is for static input or, or no, no. Input so input. yeah. So I, I really I guess I should I, I should put uh, t here because a a in general will be time dependent because a a has both the, the input terms in it. So, uh, yes, in the case of, of static input, then, then A is, is static. And, and yeah, like the eigenvalue. Yeah, so. The composition is the limited value. Yeah, no, exactly. exactly. That, which is why we're not actually going to use it other than I just want to show you that, that, that this holds. But that, that's precisely why we're not going to use the, the eigenvalues. I didn't show you any of those. Um, it is left, yeah. It's actually an easy case. Um, I think I, I might have a slide at the end about it, but yeah, that's actually an easy case. So, uh, as I just alluded to, if let's say we pick an example uh, where where keeping six terms uh, was enough. In this case, I, I don't actually remember offhand what I picked as as the input parameters, but uh, if we look at just the the first few eigenvalues of the n equals 200 system and compare that to the n equals 6 system, then you see that the first few eigenvalues are, are well matched here, I, I should say, sort of in uh, relating to Heim's question. This is the, the steady state eigenvalues for, for constant input. Obviously, this is less useful in, in the dynamic case. So this is really just for illustration purposes. So uh, in this particular case, the, the first few eigenvalues are well approximated by the n equals 6 system, and then, then they, they drop off. But this is to say that Getting the first few right, unsurprisingly, is is going to give you a good, uh, good approach to steady state and uh, reasonable dynamics. Uh, that was the real part. The same is true for the imaginary part. Now let's talk about when when does this model break. Um, so the the easiest way to to understand what's going on is in terms of the the phase distribution phi running from negative pi to pi, uh, and asking when it breaks is essentially. Uh, Asking, you know, what happens when we don't keep enough terms? How many terms do we need? And what happens when we don't uh, don't fulfill that? So, here let's consider a phase distribution that, that looks like this. And in this case, I chose n equals 100, just sort of as a approximation to infinity. Uh, here, it's it's smooth, and I can tell you that uh, 100 is is essentially as good as you you can get. And let's compare the the phase distribution. Here for n equals four in this case, uh, keeping not enough terms. And what you see is that obviously since we're doing a truncation of a Fourier expansion, then you know you miss the the height of the peak, and you also get these spurious oscillations. Now the the oscillations are actually what what kill this. It's missing the peak isn't such a big deal, but 
the fact that, that these oscillations uh, get introduced is actually terrible because remember that since we're talking about a firing rate, the firing rate is going to be given by uh, or governed by the, the value of this distribution at, at threshold. So having these extra oscillations on the tail can actually mean that we're wildly wrong. So we want to understand what, when does this happen and what can we do about it. So firing rate is at one, when you cross one to three. The, the firing rate is going to be, I mean, the, the probability density here times the, uh, the speed that it's going through. So is that your question? Yeah, all right. <coughs> so sort of to, to quantify the, the, the way that the error uh, systematically varies, I'll define epsilon to be just the, the difference in the area between these distributions. And uh, I, I want to compare that to the, the height of the distribution. The reason being that, as I said, since we're doing a, a, a truncation of a Fourier expansion, you sort of intuitively expect this to fail any time the, the distribution is very peaky, any time that there's a non-negligible contribution from, from high frequencies. So we want to compare the height of this distribution to, to the error. And when we do that, what we see is that for, for any given choice of n, the error monotonically increases uh, as a function of, of height. Again, there's some scatter because error isn't actually a function directly of, of peak height. It's just sort of a proxy for when it's uh, going to break. And then, of course, uh, depending on how many terms we keep, the, the slope of this dependence changes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, uh, yeah. sort of. I mean, to to make this plot, I can only show you the static case. There's sort of not, nothing I could think of to uh, to show the, the error in the dynamic case other than than the eigenvalues. But um, but yeah. Okay. So one thing I will say is that the dependence, the the error here, you know, here I guess we're looking at the the steady state distributions, and the, this error is actually very tightly correlated to the error in the leading eigenvalues, which will tell you something about the, uh, the error in the dynamics. So of course, we, we would have to compute the, the eigenvalues at, at each iteration. But essentially, th this will tell you when you go into a regime where the eigenvalues are not going to be well approximated, which is saying the dynamics go bad. So for, for a given neuron, you change the, the DC input? That's how you change the yeah, I mean, so what I actually did here, I, I have the plot, but actually I'll just draw it. Uh, I mean, what, what's going on under the hood here is, is just looking at some, some two-dimensional plot here uh, on one axis, the, the mean input on the other axis, uh, the diffusion, and, and just picking uh, just a, a grid of points across here. And each, each of these grid points is, is a dot in, in that plot. And uh, a plot that I, that I can show you at the end uh, is that the, the error curves plotting it this way actually look very similar to the error curves if you look at uh, how the leading eigenvalue, uh, the error in the leading eigenvalue depends on these parameters. Is this again for static eye or for one set of oscillation? The static eye? Yeah, the, this curve is for steady, steady state. state. Yeah, yeah. All right, and so, I mean, as I uh, sort of already said, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, the, the distribution is going to be, or if the distribution is peaky, we, we expect it to break. So uh, if, so it turns out that, the, that this happens essentially anytime the input is very negative. You can think of this as the, the input pushing all of the neurons b backwards away from threshold. And what that actually means is that any time the distribution is very peaky, the firing rate is very low because everybody is sitting far from threshold, so the firing rate is just given by this long tail, which I said is why the firing rate estimate is bad, but now I want to say that in addition to the estimate being bad, the, the, rate, the underlying rate itself is very, very close to zero. So to show you what that looks like, uh, now just looking at fi curves for different uh, choices in, in the expansion, if we keep 100 terms, 10 terms, 6, 4, and 2. And essentially, 
for, for very large input, we can keep two or I'm not showing it, but even one, one term, it's sufficiently large input. And then uh, obviously as we uh, go towards more negative inputs, then, uh, then you start to need more terms to get a reasonable approximation. But since all we care about is getting, uh, getting the, the firing rate right, then just picking some minimal value of the input and saying that everything below this is sort of is flat or, uh, or constant it is essentially going to be good enough. So if, if, if we know what we'd like to pick as, uh, as a number of terms, then we know uh, how, how close to zero we can reliably estimate the, the firing rate. And so as a prescription for, uh, for how we can build this model, uh, essentially I'm saying that we can pick some number of terms and then impose a minimum current. And all that means is that we're, we're going to be missing some values between firing rate of you know, some epsilon and, and zero. But for the purposes of building a rate model that's, that's useful, I'm going to suggest that, that that's actually going to be good enough. So, Are you going to like to point? So we can either, we, we can do one of two things. Either we can say that everything below this is zero, or we can say that the input at this value is, or we can say that the input below the, the cutoff is equal to the cutoff. It's not, not really going to matter for the purposes I'm talking about, but, uh, but yeah, we, we have to pick some, some way to, to define the firing rate when, whenever the input is saying it should be below that. Can you also have your rate model have negative rates? No. Uh, that's cool. yeah. Well, so, I mean, that's, oops. Well, so, I mean, picking this cutoff is precisely what, what is going to uh, kill that because, so here, you know, the, uh, w the only way you can get a negative rate is by keeping not enough terms and then, you know, dipping below the, the cutoff. So as long as we proportionally pick the, the cutoff and, and the, or the cutoff in input and the cutoff in frequencies, then that's never going to happen. All right, so uh, I guess I'm running shorter on time, uh, but now let's, let's, Say, can this formalism actually uh, be be used in to describe a spiking network uh, with just two rate units? So, uh, just from the work of many other people, we know that this is going to work uh, anytime the the inputs to any of these spiking neurons are conditionally independent. Uh, and obviously, in addition to that, we we now have a second condition, which is that that, that we keep enough terms in expansion. So let's see if this actually works. The spiking network is going to be composed of M excitatory and M inhibitory neurons. Uh, again, uh, we're going to consider theta neurons, where now the only thing I've added is, is coupling with uh, some weight matrix Wij, and uh, then pulse uh, coupling. So this is a sequence of delta functions. Uh, we're going to, for now, consider uh, the weight matrix to be Gaussian with the uh, mean of mu and uh, variance uh, of sigma and, or sigma squared, sorry. Um, and now the corresponding rate network is going to be the same as before, except now, of course, we have uh, coupling in, in the moments uh, i and d. So now the, the firing rates uh, of the excitatory and inhibitory unit are going to depend on themselves and, and each other. And the rest of the, the model is going to be the same as before. So Let's see if it works. If I rig up a case where the, uh, the spiking network is in an asynchronous regime here on the top showing spikes from the inhibitory spiking network, the bottom from the excitatory spiking network, then essentially keeping only six terms, we can reproduce the, this network easily with, uh, with our two unit rate model. And this shouldn't surprise anybody, sort of matching asynchronous uh, state in a firing rate network isn't hard. But if we then crank up the excitatory recurrence sufficiently to, to push the spiking network in a synchronous regime, we want to see if this still works. So changing only uh, WEE, the excitatory recurrence, now the spiking network starts to become synchronized. And surprisingly, keeping again only six terms, we can essentially reproduce this exactly. You know, missing some finite size effects and also m missing the, uh, the, the height of, of the, the peaks. But 
this is really nice uh, in the sense that now we have a rate model that can, uh, that can do both the asynchronous firing and synchronous firing. Uh, and so now, moving forward, uh, the reason why we like this is that uh, we can now ask, how do these additional dynamics actually change uh, the dynamics uh, in large rate networks in the way that, that lots of people have thought of before? All right, so I think I just have, how am I doing? Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, this last part is very preliminary. I, I'm not gonna have uh, a lot to say about it, but uh, if we consider uh, a f large firing rate network uh, of either two flavors, uh, either using sort of a conventional firing rate model that I'll define in a second, or our Fokker-Planck uh, derived firing rate model, uh, then we can ask, w what have we added? So we have our two different rate models uh, governed by these equations, where in both cases, we're going to have uh, rate coupling with some uh, matrix GIJ that's going to have zero mean and variance one over uh, the size of the network. And uh, for the, what I'm going to call the conventional case, the nonlinearity of, of the input is going to be chosen to be the FI curve of the quadratic integrating fire model. The reason being that even this uh, change from, say, the hyperbolic tangent that's commonly considered uh, actually introduces some, uh, some non-trivial changes to the, the dynamics. So to properly compare, we're going to look at this rate model as compared to, uh, to our new rate model, where here the nonlinearity is just going to be the, uh, the system of equations that, that I've been talking about. And we'll consider 20 terms, or I, th I think, uh, actually, I may show you one with 10. OK, so let's, oops, I should back up. Uh, so now let's say, uh, let's say we crank up the G, uh, the gain, sufficiently to, to put both networks in, in the chaotic regime. What do we get? The conventional firing rate model might have dynamics that look something like this, here just showing the dynamics of one, one neuron in this large network as a function of time. And the, the Fokker-Planck rate model will do something like this for, for the same choice of the parameters. Now, the obvious difference here is that uh, we've, we've essentially introduced some, some fast time scale to, to the chaos. Uh, now, whether or not this is adding uh, high frequencies or uh, just sort of supplementing in sort of a broadband uh, or creating broadband chaos is something that, that we're sort of still thinking about. And I suspect the answer may be both just looking at uh, different parameter regimes. So sort of just coming back to the original question, <coughs> uh, I showed you that, that uh, with a fast change in input, uh, we need a fast response or a fast change in the firing rates. And we can capture that with, with a tractable rate model. And when we actually implement that in a large network, uh, we have a fast dynamic in the intrinsic uh, dynamics. Uh, and, and sort of moving forward, what we're thinking about is, is what do these new features do uh, in large networks? So uh, I'll stop there. And thanks, obviously, Larry and everyone else that's contributed. So, I mean, you mean uh, in, in sort of this, this case? Yeah, so not really. The, the reason for, for starting to look at these models is that we're, we're pushing to a case where you need a very large computer even to run the, the corresponding spike, net, spike network. So, I mean, David Tassillo, who's, uh, who's also in the lab, is building one of these, the corresponding large spiking network. So we, we can sort of do it, but... The, the whole the point here is to push sort of beyond what we can actually feasibly do with the spiking networks. Okay. All right.